welcome to uh, our first Chestnut Chat of 2022. Thank you guys for attending. And um, I see a lot of familiar names. Um, some of you uh, who are uh, regular and who have perfect attendance to Chestnut Chat, thanks for, for continuing it. Um, I don't even have perfect attendance, <laughs> so I really appreciate you guys coming on. I always watch the recording if I can't make it. Um, I'm Sarah Fitzsimmons. I'm the Director of Restoration for the American Chestnut Foundation. Uh, I think this is the first chestnut chat I've had for my office. I'm excited about this. So welcome to my office instead of my living room. Um, a little bit of housekeeping uh, as usual for chestnut chat. Um, if you just want to talk and uh, amongst people with me, Lisa Taylor, um, or, or the other attendees, use the chat. So the chat is for snarky comments, witty banter, um, telling us about the weather where you're at because it's cold and that's fun to talk about. Um, throw that kind of stuff in the chat. If you have a question, please use the Q&A module. That just helps me keep that uh, together in one place. Um, there's a question already, can you link to the recording? I will, yes. All of our recordings are put up about um, a week after uh, the Chestnut Chat. Uh, everything's on our YouTube page. Uh, so if you look up the American Chestnut Foundation YouTube on YouTube, you'll find the recordings of all of our Chestnut Chats. Or if you Google American Chestnut Foundation Chestnut Chat, you'll get the whole uh, litany of chestnut chats that we've done. We're, we're over 30 now, I think, of all the chats that we've done since April of 2020. Um, so uh, yeah, Q&A, I'm going to hold all the questions until the end. Um, I like to have a conversation uh, with, with uh, our uh, presenters after the end. So unless you guys have a really burning question, if there's something super confusing, I will um, I will uh, interrupt Taylor and ask him that question. John says, I don't see who all is here. Um, no, you can't. So as an attendee, um, you guys can, unfortunately can't see all the participants. Uh, you only get to see the three of us, uh, Lisa, me, and Taylor. We're the only people you get to see and hear. Um, everybody else, you can't show your webcam. You don't get to um, share your uh, microphone or anything. Um, so it's very much a push. <laughs> um, type of environment. Uh, and that's mainly because we've got almost 200 participants. And so that just keeps it um, a lot easier to, to keep organized. Hi, Hill. Um, uh, Sharon says, today marks 32 since starting Chestnut Chat. That's great. I'm really excited. I love doing these. And I love all of y'all who come here and listen to us and ask amazing questions every month. Um, I usually plug the next chest chat, chestnut chat at the end, but I'm going to remember to do it today. Next month, we're going to have Paul Schauberg from the U.S. Forest Service. He's going to be talking about cold tolerance in American chestnut. They've got a really cool provenance slash common garden study up in Vermont, um, and he's going to share information about adaptability and cold tolerance in American chestnut. So I hope you guys can come join us February 18th for Paul. Um, with that, I think I covered all the, I'm a little rusty. It's been a couple of months since I've done this. Lisa, did I cover everything? Did great, right, Sarah. So I'm, I'm gonna turn this over to Lisa to introduce our speaker today. Uh, Taylor, Taylor, I'm so excited to have you on here. This is a really fun topic. I really enjoy it. So uh, thank you guys for coming. Lisa, thanks for coming. Taylor, I can't wait to talk to you after this. And uh, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Lisa. Thanks, Sarah. Um, always masterful. You're not rusty at all at facilitating the Chestnut Chats. Again, for those of you that are new to Chestnut Chat, it was sort of pulled together as a lark so we could keep together as a community during the, the lockdowns. And now that the pandemic has dragged on a bit, they've just stayed very popular and we don't have any seem to have any problem getting subjects. And as Sarah said, we have great curious audiences that ask great questions. So thank you so much for showing up. And um, I just wanted to plug our end of year um, campaign, because as you know, 95% of our revenue and our work comes from private um, donations. And we exceeded our end of year goal by $100,000. We raised $350,000. And many of you on this call were super generous. So thank you for keeping us alive and well. Um, I first met Taylor in Chattanooga when um, Hill Craddock took us out to a a brewery and I met a lot of his graduate students and um, just was really taken with Taylor's uh, sincere affection for uh, the species and his seriousness and his um, research and so forth. So you've read his bio, I won't add to that, but thank you, Taylor. I really am so happy you're here. Unfortunately, I have to hop off, um, but I'm gonna watch it later and I look forward to it. And to everybody that came today, thank you so much and happy new year. Take it away, Taylor. All right, thank you, Lisa. Mm -hmm. 
All right. Well, um, thank you to the folks at the Chestnut Foundation and also um, uh, the membership for uh, requesting uh, this talk. I'm really happy to um, put on my paleontologist hat, which is actually uh, something that was not in my bio, is that um, I've always really wanted to be a paleontologist. Um, my training is in population genetics and plant breeding, a lot of DNA sequencing uh, work, and, and that's mainly my background. Um, I've never really done fossil research, but I had a lot of fun pulling together uh, some of these paleobotanical uh, resources to put together this talk and actually learned um, quite a bit. And there's a little controversy uh, regarding when certain groups emerged, and I will discuss some of that throughout the course of my talk today. So as a um, general background for this, this subject, it helps to keep the system of biological taxonomy in, in mind. And we all learn this, I think, probably in, in middle school, at least for me. Um, biological taxonomy, at least the naming system, goes from kingdom at the highest level down to species at the, at the lowest level. It gets a little more complex than this, um, but what's, what's important about this naming system is that as it's used nowadays, um, a good accurate naming system is reflective of evolutionary history. So all of the different species that are in the genus Castanea are going to be more closely related to one another than they are to species in the genus Quercus, which is another genus in the plant family Phagaceae. So Phagaceae is where we're going to start off uh, with our evolutionary journey today. Phagaceae is the plant family that includes uh, chestnut trees, oaks, uh, beech trees, which is uh, Phagus, and there are multiple genera of of um, trees in southeastern Asia, like Castanopsis. Uh, there are a couple of genera out on the west coast. Hey Taylor, I'm I'm, yes. I'm sorry I'm sorry to interrupt you. Um, yeah. Your uh, audio is cutting in and out a little bit. It's a little, can you turn off your screen maybe um, uh, the webcam? Maybe that'll help free up some bandwidth. Um, All right, I will do that. Let's see. How's how's that? Is is my signal any better that way? No, it still sounds pretty wonky. Um, let's let's try it for a little while and see if it if it gets any better. If not, we might want to um, we'll try something else. Okay. All right. So the family Phagaceae also includes uh, genera on on the west coast, like Chrysolopus, which gets the common name uh, golden chinkapin. And they look very similar to, to Castanea. All right, so um, for most of the talk today, we're going to be focused on two main types of evidence that are used to study Castanea evolution. So going back into deep time, tens of millions of years into the past, uh, we are pretty much limited to fossils. And it's not just leaf fossils like I've shown here. We also have a pretty abundant record of pollen fossils going back tens of millions of years. And folks that study palynology have been able to, um, through microscopy work, have been able to figure out different diagnostic features that can be used to separate uh, Castanea pollen from oak pollen. But as we get into uh, time scales going back in the thousands of years from the present, we don't really have such an extensive fossil record in terms of leaf compression, compressions like I've shown here. So we have to rely on DNA sequences. Um, the way this works is that 
we sequence several individuals of the same species or of multiple related species. Um, we sequence the, the same gene or genes in those individual plants. And then we line up those sequences against one another. And once we have this alignment, then we can count the number of differences in DNA sequence that exists between these different individuals. And once we have these counts of differences in DNA sequence, which we call polymorphisms, um, then we can start to come up with some pretty good hypotheses about how those individuals are related to one another through evolutionary time. Um, the reason for that is that these, these differences in sequence are indicative of past mutation that has occurred at, at a past generation. And based off of this information, then we can start to construct phylogenetic trees or uh, also known as evolutionary trees or platograms. And in this example, individuals one and two share a mutation you know, highlighted in, in purple, the, the G mutation and the C mutation highlighted in red, which individual three does not have. So individual one and two are inferred to be more closely related to one another in evolutionary time. And three, in this case, is going to be a sister taxon or a sister group to individuals one and, and two. So nowadays, there are between seven and 10 castaneda species that exist around the world. And I have this range here, seven to 10, uh, because the number of, of species that, that, you, that you get will depend on which taxonomist that, that you ask. So some people have a, a tendency to recognize uh, more species than others, we call those um, splitters in, in the botany world. And then folks that would tend to lump multiple varieties together as part of one bigger species, we would call those people lumpers. Um, and this is usually done affectionately. Um, but here in North America, uh, this can get kind of... Uh, debated hotly uh, how many species of, of chinkapin there are and whether we should consider Ozark chinkapin, which has the, the range that's shown in, um, in red shading in the lower map, um, whether Ozark chinkapin should be a separate species from Allegheny chinkapin, uh, shown as C. pumula variety pumula. So how, how did we get to seven to 10 Castanea species that grow in Eastern North America, Eastern Asia, Western Europe, and the sort of uh, dividing area between Europe and, and Asia? So to do that, we have to go back about 80 million years to start to get a hang on that. So just to put this all in perspective, uh, Angiosperms had appeared by the early Cretaceous. That's about 130 million years ago is when we have our first bona fide fossils of flowering plants in the, in the fossil record. One of the earliest is this uh, specimen shown on, on the left. This is a fruit capsule of Montsechia vidalii from 130 million years ago. And, and then these floral structures begin to get a little more uh, elaborate uh, as we progress in time. Uh, I really like this uh, image on the, on the far right of my, Micropedasos bermensis, uh, preserved in, in amber, like Jurassic Park, which inspired me to want to be a paleontologist when I saw that movie in the 90s. And then around 83 million years ago, we started to get the first evidence of 
phagaceae, plant family phagaceae in the fossil record. And what separates this family from other plant families is that the phagaceae uh, produce their, their fruit in a cupule structure, which is a nut either covered on one end by a, by a cup, like, uh, like an acorn, or in the case of chestnut, there will be a nut that is completely encased in the cupule. And with chestnut, that cupule is, is the burr that we know. So you can see in this image, uh, this protophagacea alanensis from 83 to 72 million years ago uh, has a four-lobed cupule. Um, and American chestnut, interestingly, I think has uh, a four-lobed uh, cupule. This fossil is actually from, it was sampled from central Georgia. And, and there's a little bit of a discrepancy in in the fossil record with uh, evidence from DNA sequencing studies. So earliest evidence of phagaceae comes from Georgia. Uh, however, one hypothesis that we see um, abundantly in the literature is that phagaceae as a family is thought to have originated in Southeast Asia. Now, not everybody thinks this, but um, Many authors uh, ascribe to this, this idea. Um, evidence for that, that idea of a Southeastern Asian origin for phagaceae uh, comes from the fact that there are simply more phagaceae species, more genera in that family, in that part of the world in Eastern Asia than there are here in Eastern North America. So diversity is, is highest in Eastern Asia. And we have pretty good evidence from many other plant species that generally where you have highest species diversity, where you have highest genetic diversity, in many cases, uh, that's a center of, of origin for, for that organism. So at about 56 million years ago, um, we have evidence that the phagaceae are beginning to uh, evolve a little bit more. They're starting to diversify. We have evidence of, of multiple genera of, of um, phagaceae that look pretty different from one another. So this uh, specimen on the, uh, the top photo, the trigono belenoidea, uh, to me, that looks a lot like an acorn. You can see the cup on the bottom of that image and, and the scales that project off of that. And then the bottom two images are of something called Kessinopsoidea. And this is where we start to see plants that are beginning to really look like Castanea. And that section of the image that I've highlighted with a, a gold box uh, shows a uh, immature flower, uh, which I think for probably many of you who have pollinated uh, chestnut trees when you're doing control crosses, that flower kind of has just sort of the general morphology, the general shape and appearance of, of a modern day uh, chestnut flower. One key difference though, is that this flower has three styles, which you can see, I'm gonna try to See if I can use a pointer here and point out some of these features to you. Um, well, I think I can use my cursor, right, Sarah? Can you see that? So, so there are three styles in this in this section of the, of the image. Uh, and this differs from Castanea, which has six styles per pistillate flower. So we're not quite getting all of those floral uh, features of Castanea just yet. Also, we have something that looks pretty similar to a burr, but part of the nut is not covered by the spines of the burr just yet. Uh, 
right. Let's see. It looks like my slides are kind of slow. Hmm. Well, I think my, my slides have frozen up, which uh, did not happen during my practice talks. So I'll try to see what's going on with that. Taylor, while you're doing that, I'm, I might, um, oh, there you go. Okay. Sarah, did you want to did you want to mention something? Uh, no. So a couple people. So the um, the uh, uh, sound is still kind of wonky. I'm guessing it's a bandwidth issue, especially because the um, the uh, slides are are freezing up. Um, a couple people have asked uh, if if maybe your speakers are on. Maybe you could use headphones. I don't know if that will help, but I just want to throw out. You know, we're still getting kind of some breakup in audio. So for for our audience, um, I hope that's not too <laughs> too distracting. I think we can still hear you, Taylor. I think it's still fine. Um, but just to let you know that that is going on. I think it's a bandwidth thing. I'm not sure what else we can do. Um, but uh, I think for now we'll just go on. But if you do have a pair of headphones handy. Maybe we can try that. All right, I have headphones in. So yeah, um, just let me know if, uh, if it doesn't clear up. And what I might do is there's, I can, I can run to, my office, which is just five minutes away from here. And I was actually every everybody. It sounds really good to me. And everybody in the chat is like, oh, my God, it's so much better. So let's let's oh. run with the headphone thing and, and hopefully that'll stick around. OK, great. All right. So um, at about 50 to 40 million years ago, so we're moving six million years forward in, in time. Which is uh, so this is called the mid Eocene. We have the first really solid evidence of, of chestnut-like fossils. Um, so these are images of compression fossils of a plant called Castanioidea perurensis. So perurensis is derived from uh, a small town per year in Tennessee, uh, which is a couple hours drive uh, west of, of Nashville. And it's, it's remarkable to me, and, and like I said, I'm not a paleontologist, so I, I don't, my knowledge of the methods used in paleontology is not as, as deep as, say, for population genetics, but these fossils were found in a brick pit in a small town in Tennessee, um, which I think is pretty remarkable um, and is exciting uh, because who knows what kind of other cool stuff is out in, in brick pits across the country. Um, but anyway, so this, uh, this image of the, uh, of the burr on the left uh, has been called the, the, the first fossil castanea. So you can see the, the classic uh, spines uh, that are on uh, American chestnuts today. We also have fossil male catkins, uh, and and it's it's pretty amazing all of the measurements that the uh, authors of this paper did on these on these flowers fell right within the range of of measurements for things like axis length and axis width of of the catkins that we see in modern day uh, castanea. Uh, also, the arrangement of the florets is exactly the same. Uh, it looks like the, the surface features of the pollen uh, have not changed much in the 50-ish million years since these, um, since these fossils were, um, were laid down. So uh, yeah, pretty cool. Um, 
And so shortly after, um, after this time, uh, around 50-ish to 40-ish million years ago, we start to see more fossils of Castaneda uh, showing up around the world. And there are some really great resources online. The University of Washington, uh, their Burke Museum uh, has an excellent uh, paleontology collection that you can visit on their website and you can look at and download these images just like I've done here. Um, so at this point around 40 million years ago, uh, Castanea fossils um, have been found in British Columbia, Washington State, Oregon, Idaho, Montana, Wyoming, Colorado, uh, also Western Greenland, uh, Alaska. And uh, to me, they, the, the leaf compressions look very similar to modern day Castanea leaves. Uh, kind of a strong dentation on, on some of these specimens. Um, and I'm not showing it here, but um, some of these studies have used uh, electron microscopy to look at trichomes. And that's how a lot of these fossils are confirmed as, as Castanea. So to be a really solid, um, uh, to have solid evidence that this is Castanea and not uh, a beech leaf or something else in the Phagaceae family. Uh, well, the standard um, for this field is to really show uh, the, tr the trichomes, to try to get a good look at the trichomes um, that are on these, these ancient plants. So around the same time uh, as, as Castanea was really showing up across North America, uh, we also have fossils of, of this genus in Eastern Asia showing up, um, which is hypothesized to be the, um, the origin of, of the genus Castanea. So in 1975, uh, Richard James um, published uh, a chapter in, in advances in, in fruit breeding in a book. And in his article, he hypothesized an origin of Castaneda in Eastern Asia because species diversity of the genus is highest in that area. Um, he also hypothesized that, that this genus migrated west into, into Europe and migrated east into North America. But he didn't really have access to um, DNA sequencing at this point in time. So he couldn't compare things like genetic diversity of, of the different species across the globe. Uh, he also didn't have access to uh, this uh, really large collection of well-curated um, fossils, which we have now and has really ramped up since the 1980s. So we might wonder how, how would uh, Castanea get from Eastern Asia, where, where it appears to have originated, into Eastern North America? So 40 million years ago, um, there, were, there were land bridges uh, connecting Eastern North America and Western Asia, and also connecting Western North America to Eastern Asia. Um, we call the one that would have crossed Greenland uh, into present day Canada, the North Atlantic land bridge. And the one going from Alaska to Russia, the Bering land bridge. So what, what was very um, different about the climate at, at this point in time during the Eocene was that the climate was much warmer. Um, tropic conditions existed across much larger areas of the globe. Uh, temperate species like, uh, like chestnuts and, and oak grew at much higher latitudes. 
so it's it's thought that these forests were these temperate forests were existing in a nearly continuous band across the high latitudes. And in this way, uh, species in, in the genus Castanea and also, also many other temperate uh, genera that exist in Eastern North America and in Asia had populations stretching uh, across uh, multiple continents at this point. Uh, there's an old term in the literature called the Arcto-Tertiary Geoflora, um, which is uh, the term used to describe this assemblage of species that occupied this zone at the high latitudes and that move from, from Eastern Asia to North America and to Europe um, through these land bridges. Um, but this term, Arcto-Tertiary Geoflora, isn't, isn't really used that much uh, nowadays. So uh, about 20 million years ago, uh, Greenland fully separates from North America. Uh, this land bridge is um, completely sunk below the ocean, cutting off uh, those populations uh, in North America and Europe from one another. And, and then about 10,000 years ago, the Bering Land Bridge closes uh, for the last time. Um, and uh, one of the more well-known examples of, uh, of migration across the Bering Land Bridge is, of course, uh, humans who, who are thought to have uh, made it from Eastern Asia into North America uh, around 20-ish thousand years ago. And this number is uh, getting pushed, uh, pushed back farther into time. Um, it's my understanding. So in, in more recent time, when we're looking at divergence between species that are uh, growing on, on the same uh, continent as one of the like American chestnut and chinkapins, unfortunately, we don't really have a very good fossil record for that because uh, the central trait that we use to separate American chestnut from chinkapin is that American chestnut produces three nuts per burr and chinkapin produces one nut per burr. But when we look back in the fossil record, we don't have any examples really of, of where one nut per burr really starts to show up in, in Castanea. So we don't know exactly how far back this divergence between American chestnut and chinkapin happened. So in this case, we have to use DNA sequencing evidence to try to figure out how these species are related to one another. And a really important study uh, in, in this area of research came from Dr. Finney Dane's lab, who was a professor at Auburn University. And uh, importantly, this was the first study to actually sequence DNA from all of the uh, existing Castanea species worldwide. And so it gave us the first uh, really um, solid view of, of how the North American species are related to European and, and Asian species. Um, so they inferred an evolutionary tree in their study from chloroplast DNA, um, which was one of the first tools that was, that was used by, by plant evolutionary biologists uh, around the 90s and, and early 2000s. And what they learned is that Castanea sativa, European chestnut, groups with the North American species of Castanea. Um, so it's more closely related to those species than it is to Asian species. And at the, at the base of the Castanea evolutionary tree is Castanea cronata, the, the Japanese chestnut. So that, that is the um, basal lineage uh, in this group. And that led uh, Lange et al. to uh, propose a, a different hypothesis 
or how Castaneda um, migrated around the globe. So like Richard Jaynes, uh, they, they proposed that Castaneda did originate in Southeastern Asia, where species diversity and genetic diversity is highest. And that was another finding of their study, was that um, when they compared their sequences, there was just more genetic diversity um, in addition to species diversity. And that because Japanese chestnut was at the base of the evolutionary tree, uh, that that was further evidence to support an Asian origin for the genus. And that because Castanea sativa was sister to the North American species, that it was more likely that Castanea migrated west into Europe from Asia and then migrated across the North Atlantic land bridge across Greenland into Eastern North America. And that is consistent with, um, with fossils that have been found in Greenland of Castanea. But one of the paradoxes of their results is that uh, the Allegheny chinkapin in this tree, uh, it's labeled C. pumula variety pumula, is actually more closely related to Castaneda dentata than it is to Castaneda pumula variety ozarkensis. And that's confusing because Allegheny chinkapin and Ozark chinkapin both produce one nut per burr. Their leaves look pretty similar. If you go to central Arkansas and you uh, go look at these plants in the field, um, the one of the main differences is that they just differ in habit. Ozark chinkapin is um, more of a tree, and pumila is more of a more of a shrub in that part of the world. So that's kind of a head scratcher there. Um, but I think. Most likely, this result is an artifact of sequencing chloroplast uh, DNA. So one thing that is that is um, makes chloroplast DNA easy to work with is that it's in a chloroplast genome, which is separate from the nuclear genome. The chloroplast genome is maternally inherited. It is only inherited. Uh, through the seed, and it does not recombine. And it's also a pretty small genome. Uh, it makes it uh, easy to work with. Um, it makes it easy to make uh, alignments of chloroplast DNA among uh, different individuals. But the hang up is that it is maternally inherited and it evolves pretty slowly. Um, so, this suggests that maybe some, some more sequence data from, from the nuclear genome, which is inherited from both parents, um, would, would help uh, clear up this issue of how is American chestnut related to the, the chinkapins in North America. So moving forward in, in Skipping forward in time to the, the Pleistocene, which started 2.5 million years ago, uh, we had some pretty drastic uh, changes that are, that are happening. So from the Eocene, uh, which is when Castaneda began to really pop up around the globe, up to the Pleistocene, the climate gradually started to get colder and, and drier. And what we think happened is that as, as the interior of the continents became cooler and drier, these temperate species like Castanea, um, populations started to move away from the interior, started to become extirpated from places like Colorado, Montana, and Wyoming. And this happened not only in North America, but also, also in Asia. Um, and that's hypothesized to be uh, the means by which uh, Castanea sativa became separated from the Eastern Asian Castanea species. So beginning in the, in the Pleistocene, uh, the uh, 
climate really started to get much colder. And we start to see ice sheets occupying huge areas across the Northern hemisphere. And there were about, there were multiple episodes of glaciation and retreat, but the most recent glacial maximum happened about 20,000 years ago. Uh, and, and in this figure, the Laurentide ice sheet had its uh, maximum expanse going south to around the Ohio River, close to where Cincinnati is today. And the effect of this on Castanea populations is that they started to get pushed south to, to the coastal plain. And we know this from, from pollen samples that have been retrieved from uh, cores that have been taken from lakes and ponds in Eastern North America. And the, the early classic study of, of Castaneda palynology was uh, by Margaret Davis, um, who uh, did this sort of analysis for several tree species that grow in the Eastern US. What she found was that 15,000 years ago, um, shortly after the, the glaciers just started to, to recede, uh, Castanea uh, appeared to be limited more to the south and west of where it grows today. And that there was a steady progression of Castanea populations north and east over the ensuing 15,000 years. Um, by about 2,000 years ago, it looks like Castanea is starting to show up in Massachusetts and in New England. Um, and it's a pretty dramatic example of, of these tree populations making big movements over the course of 15,000 years. So to do this, they would have had to have moved. Um, it doesn't seem like much, but they would have had to have moved hundreds of yards uh, per year um, in some cases to, to make up these distances. But one, one tough thing about this sort of research is that um, there are really no surface features on Castanea pollen that allow us to distinguish between American chestnut and the chinkapins. So sort of a drawback of, of this study is that while, while this paper says that this is Castanea dentata pollen, um, as far as I can tell, there really isn't much of a way to rule out the fact that this could also be uh, chinkapin pollen that's in these samples. So there are some new methods that uh, have come out in the last couple of years that I'm excited about and that I expect will allow us to um, get a bit of a better handle on the movement of American chestnut across Eastern North America over the last 20-ish thousand years. Um, so one technology is species distribution modeling. Um, and, and that can be used in conjunction with, with pollen records as uh, shown in this uh, recent paper from Spriggs and Fertakos. And this was published, it came out, I think about three months ago. So with species distribution modeling, um, we can take what we know about uh, habitat preferences, tolerances of, of a species as, as we know it. And then we can take what we know about what the climate was probably like in an area through time. And we can make predictions about where that species was on the landscape uh, going into the past. Um, and, and so these predictions uh, can be tested by going out and sampling pollen records from lake sediments. Um, and, and so I think it, it has a lot of promise, uh, but as shown in this, in this figure, there's uh, 
there's some contradictions between the, the pollen records and the species distribution modeling. So sort of the, I don't wanna call it dogma, but the, the orthodoxy that, that we know about, um, about Castanea migration after the last ice age is that Castanea showed up in New England about, about 2000 years ago. But if you look at uh, the, the um, panel on the, on the far right in the middle at 6,000 years before present, uh, there's a lot of, of northern latitudes at 6,000 years ago that are um, predicted to be suitable for, for American chestnut. And, and indeed, it looks like uh, some of the pollen records are, are showing uh, American chestnut in Ontario 6,000 years before present. Uh, so I think, I think that's interesting. Um, I haven't gotten a chance to go in and look at each of the data points used in this paper, uh, but that's something as I'm doing my own research that I, I plan on doing uh, to just do some QC on, on those data if I can get a little more background info because I'm very curious about that, that data point in Ontario at 6,000 years ago. So one process that we know to be very important across uh, other plant groups, uh, ranging from grasses to other trees, is that different species within a genus, if they're closely related enough, when they come into contact, they can sometimes hybridize one, with one another. Uh, the result in some cases can be that they will create a new lineage that is reproductively isolated and be can become a new species. In other cases, natural selection will, um, will select against the hybrid progeny and they become an evolutionary dead end. In other cases, uh, hybridization between uh, different species uh, that are closely related can allow for the transfer of genetic adaptations between different species. So this paper came out about a year ago uh, and it, it was focused on Castanea species in Eastern Asia. And they had some pretty big findings, uh, which was that it appears that there is a lineage of, of Castanea henryi, which um, is given uh, status as a, a variety of Castanea henryi, variety omiensis. And it has ancestry from Castanea henryi, variety henryi, and it has ancestry from Castanea melissima. Um, so Castanea henryi and melissima have ranges that overlap in, in Eastern Asia. Uh, so this is, uh, for me, a big finding um, because we know that it's pretty easy to cross Castanea species. People have been doing it uh, for um, about a hundred years now, or even longer to create trees that have desirable uh, agronomic qualities. Um, so to have some solid uh, genomic evidence from naturally occurring trees is, uh, is a pretty big finding. So I've had a suspicion that maybe uh, the North American Castanea species um, might have hybridized with, with one another at some point in the past, because sometimes when we go out in the field, we find plants that are sort of morphologically intermediate between American chestnut and, and chinkapin. So when I say morphologically intermediate, I mean that they grow uh, as trees like American chestnut, uh, yet they produce one nut per burr like chinkapins, and they have a leaf shape like American chestnut and trichomes that are not really like American chestnut and not really like, like 
chinkapin either. So um, one example of these is the is the snag that I've uh, included a photo of on the, the bottom right corner, Castanea alabamensis. And that is a name that was given to uh, a group of plants that grow in Northern Alabama. This was in the early 20th century. And uh, many botanists thought that these plants were hybrids of American chestnut and chinkapin. So here's a better look at the leaves of Castanea alabamensis. So they're long lanceolate, like American chestnut. Uh, they have the classic canoe shape of American chestnut. They have deep leaf, leaf teeth with, um, with some of the teeth that are kind of hooked. And they're very different from most Allegheny chinkapin leaves in, uh, in leaf shape. So I and, and other people, um, Going back uh, back to the 1920s, botanist wondered, is Castanea alabamensis a hybrid of American chestnut and Allegheny chinkapin? So to, to test that hypothesis, uh, I went out into the field, uh, sampling locations between the years 2015, 2016, 2017, um, I also had access to legacy samples in Hill Craddock's lab, uh, samples that he and, and his grad students had collected uh, about a decade prior. Um, we tried to get access to American chestnut samples um, from as much of the natural range as, as we could, uh, from Maine all the way down to Alabama and Georgia. And I mainly went out and collected uh, Allegheny chinkapin and C. alabamensis samples. And C. alabamensis was, uh, for me, a pretty exciting find. This was in 2015. I uh, was doing um, field work with members of the Alabama chapter, and we were finding plants that they called chinka nuts. And I was totally perplexed. I took the samples home. I used the taxonomic keys to try to key them out, see if they were American chestnuts, but they, they just weren't quite right. The, the trichomes were different. Um, and then once I got a look at the burrs, the burrs were definitely not American chestnut burrs. Um, so we got about a hundred samples. And we used a, a new technology that nobody who had done Castanea sequencing uh, before had, had used. We used something called genotyping by sequencing, which um, our collaborator, Tatiana Zabinyayeva, who at that point was at Clemson University, had optimized a protocol for mapping quantitative trait loci um, for disease resistance. Um, using genotyping by sequencing. What it allowed us to do was to get um, sequence data for hundreds of thousands of genomic locations across the nuclear genome, uh, which no one had been able to do before. And we took this data set and inferred a phylogenetic tree. Uh, interestingly, Heston and Alabamensis uh, clustered with the chinkapins, Castanea pumula, uh, variety pumula, Castanea pumula, variety osmarkensis. Um, and it was a, its own discrete little, little group of alabamensis plants. Uh, wasn't, wasn't mixed among pumula or dentata. So morphologically, it looks unique. And now we had some genetic evidence that, that it is a unique group of plants. Um, but interestingly, this was uh, in, in conflict with the phylogenetic tree that was published by Lang et al., um, who used chloroplast DNA. So they found that C. pumula variety pumula was sister to C. dentata. 
um, we found that Pumala variety Pumala was clustered right next to Ozarpensis and Alabamensis. Uh, so C. Alabamensis, definitely a chinkapin, produces one nut per burr. Um, and, and so it appears that C. dentata is pretty distinct from the chinkapin. So the nuclear DNA sequencing allowed us to have some, um, some insight there that wasn't possible with older technologies. But we really wanted to test the hypothesis of whether Celebimensis was a hybrid between Pumala and, and Dentata. Uh, so phylogenetic trees don't do a great job of testing that sort of hypothesis. Um, we had to use a different method. Uh, this one's called a phylogenetic network. So if two lineages uh, diverge from one another uh, through evolutionary time, and then they rejoin with one another later on down the road, that will create something more like a network instead of a bifurcating tree. So our prediction then is that C. alabamensis would have a reticulate pattern of descent in a phylogenetic network. What we found is that uh, C. alabamensis was not a, um, a merger of Pumala and, and Nita. The phylogenetic network showed basically the same thing that the phylogenetic tree showed, Alabamensis groups with Castaneda Pumala and Castaneda Osarkensis. Um, and an example of what a, uh, a truly hybrid sample would look like is shown by the uh, little asterisks that are that are on this tree. So that single asterisk was a hybrid of Ozark chinkapin and an Asian species, and the double asterisk was a plant that is a hybrid of American chestnut and Chinese chestnut. So. We wanted to have another test of this hypothesis. We wanted to have as many lines of evidence um, to uh, answer our question as, as we could. We used a method called a structure analysis. Um, what structure analysis does is that you can give it a, a data set of, of DNA sequence data from multiple samples and structure will find the most likely number of unique genetic groups in that data set. Then once it finds the number of unique genetic groups, then what it can do is parse out the ancestry of every individual sample, and it can assign a percentage of that individual's ancestry to one or another groups. So in this example, our prediction for sample number two, which is Alabamensis, is that if it were a hybrid, it would look like uh, this column, which uh, has a portion of chinkamid ancestry shown in blue and a portion of American chestnut ancestry shown in orange. But our actual result um, showed no evidence of American chestnut ancestry in C. alabamensis. Um, so we don't see any, any blips of, of orange in, in any of those columns. Uh, so alabamensis is 100% um, uh, chinkapin uh, in regards to its ancestry. Interestingly, structure did identify American chestnut ancestry in some chinkapins, and these were samples that we had collected from Northern Florida. Um, it wasn't much, uh, the, the sample um, inside, the, inside this gold box that's on the left had about 15% American chestnut ancestry. Um, but, What's really cool about it is that this result is consistent with this hypothesis that we have from palynological studies of American chestnut moving farther south as glaciers advanced during the ice ages. 
and staying uh, south toward the, toward the Gulf Coastal Plain until glaciers began to recede and then American chestnut uh, began to migrate north again. So our interpretation for this result is that it appears that American chestnut populations uh, that had been pushed south into the, into the Gulf Coastal Plain uh, hybridized with chinkapin and left some of their genetic signature in those populations before they later migrated back north. When we removed American chestnut from the structure analysis and only looked at Allegheny chinkapin, C. elegansis, and Ozark chinkapin, um, we have quite a bit of evidence that it looks like the different types of chinkapin um, have hybridized with, with one another. Um, I interpret that as some evidence for treating the different chinkapins as uh, varieties of one, one species. So reproductive barriers between uh, Pumala and Ozarkensis and Alabamensis are much lower than between Dentata and the chinkapins. And then when we really just focus on the samples from, from Northern Alabama, which were the, the ones that really motivated my interest in this study. Uh, and I line up the structure plot uh, by, by latitude with um, northern samples at the top of this plot, more southerly samples at the bottom of the plot. As you go farther south, Alabama chinkapin or C. alabamensis has more Pumala ancestry. Um, so it appears that natural selection may be favoring Pumala ancestry um, farther south. And, and this, is, this is just a hypothesis that uh, I think deserves uh, a little more investigation. So to go back to the main question for that study, has hybridization contributed to the diversity of Castaneda in North America? Well, in the case of C. alabamensis, the hypothesized hybrid, um, no, our data did not support um, the hybrid hypothesis for C. alabamensis, um, which I think is a little more exciting. It, it means that C. alabamensis is its own distinct entity um, most likely it's a distinct subspecies or distinct variety of, of Castanea pumila. Uh, but there are other questions that we just really couldn't get to with our genotyping by sequencing data set. And fortunately, uh, late last year, I got the good news that um, I, I was being funded by the American Chestnut Foundation to team up with, uh, with TACF and with researchers at Virginia Tech and the University of Arkansas and Penn State to get access to whole genome resequencing data for all of the North American uh, Castanea species. So one, one question that I think is uh, really pertinent to American chestnut restoration is whether, whether there has been gene flow from chinkapin into American chestnut in, in the South, because morphologically, at least, at least in terms of appearance of, of leaves, uh, it appears that American chestnuts kind of look a little more like chinkapins in some populations in the South. So I wonder whether that could be due to gene flow from, from chinkapins. Um, now this matters because uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, hybridization between species can be a means for adaptations to move from one species to another. Uh, so 
if it looks like American chestnut has received uh, genetic adaptations from chinkapins in the south uh, to maybe more droughty conditions or conditions that are more prone to fire or higher heat and humidity, then that's good information for us to have as we restore the American chestnut. So future research questions that I, I think that we're in a really good position to, to address with whole genome resequencing data are, um, has chinkapin contributed to genetic diversity in American chestnuts? Is there an adaptive significance? Uh, second question, uh, when did American chestnuts diverge from chinkapins? And as I said, we don't have fossils that demonstrate this. So we're, we're um, going to be limited to DNA um, sequencing data and the genome data is really good to uh, get a good estimate of divergence time. Uh, another thing that, that I'm interested in is what is the westernmost extent of Castanea dentata just before Phytophthora and Cryphonectria arrived? Um, because Ozark chinkapin has leaves that look pretty similar to American chestnut. Ozark chinkapin also grows as a tree in the mountainous forests of Missouri and Arkansas and Oklahoma. And um, I wonder whether American chestnut had persisted west of the Mississippi uh, just before the 20th century. And I, I think with this genome sequencing data, we will be able to, uh, to address that. Um, and another big question that uh, is a little more theoretical, um, maybe less important in application for restoration of the species is, whether the hypothesized westward migration um, that, uh, that Finney Dane's group published is supported by the genome sequencing data. Or was migration more complex? Did Castanea move into North America from uh, the Bering Land Bridge and the North Atlantic Land Bridge? Um, I think we'll be able to, to answer that question as well. So with that, I'll take any of your questions. Um, and if you need some more time to think about it, you can also email me at my Gmail account, which I've included here. I'll be happy to share these papers with you if you want to read any of this stuff that I've been looking at. Taylor, fantastic. And great pictures, too. I, I appreciate you putting all that together and, and presenting it. Um, is this C. Alabamis, alabamensis? Is that a picture of that we're seeing or is that Pumala? No, this, this is from close to Asheville. This is actually, it's interesting. It's an American chestnut and it has um, sort of more of the erect catkins. Yeah. I, you see that that much. Um, Great. So, yeah. Good picture. I love the fog coming up. We have so many questions. Narul Faridi, hey Narul, asks, what is the ancestral line or parent of Castania? Um, so it... It looks like the it's probably this Castanioide perurensis. Um, so Castanioide was the name that was given to that fossil when that paper was published. And then about 10 years later, somebody said that's Castanea. So as far as we know, that's the first really solid fossil about 50 million years ago. So Narul has a couple more questions. I know he wants to talk to you after this. So Narul, okay. now you have Taylor's email address and hopefully you guys can, can hook up. Um, he asks, is there any showing of DNA sequence differences for a particular trait from C. C. Melissima to C. dentata? It may be too early to ask this question. Yeah, I'm not aware of anything like that. Okay. And then he, he wants to make a comment. It would be interesting to characterize the ribosomal DNA in Pumila, Alabamensis, and Dentata. I agree, yeah. Okay, <laughs> um, let's go back up to the top. So Mike Alcott asks, did timber type growth, for example, the ability to reach canopy in North American forest, did it evolve as the tree moved into Europe and North America? Or did Castania start out in Asia as a timber type tree and then was bred to have orchard type growth by Asian growers selecting branchy trees to maximize nut production? Hmm. So my understanding, and these papers I read, gosh, it was a couple of years ago, the last time I read them, 
is that there has been quite a bit of selection in Eastern Asian agriculture for the orchard habit. Um, and Sarah, I think you, you've made the expedition to, to China, right? Uh, I have. And if anyone wants to sponsor me, I'll go again. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, it was, it was fantastic. And, and I agree. I mean, I, in my experience, um, at least Melissa and Henry, I, Henry, I in particular can grow timber type and the selection process is what's turned it into more of an orchard type. Now, Seguini eye is a mystery to me. Um, I still think it needs a lot more. Um, uh, it still needs a lot more um, analysis of that. I don't know, Taylor, if you were able to dive into the mysteries of Seguini eye during all of this. No, there's just not that much published on Seguini eye. Yeah, yeah. Um, Frank asks, how far back in the fossil record does chestnut go? What geological layer? I think you answered that, but if you could re repeat it. Yeah, so um, mid Eocene, 50 to 40 million years ago, that specific formation is called the, the Claiborne formation. Um, and and that, that occurrence is in, is in um, Tennessee, bit west of Nashville. Uh, so Ken has a few questions here. Um, he said there are some pictures in Don Davis's book of American chestnut leaf fossils from the tertiary period discovered in Idaho. Have you seen these pictures? Yeah, so, um, so I, I did not include those in my, uh, in my slide of, of Western Castanea or Western North American Castanea, but yeah, um, they're all over Idaho and the, the mountain states and the West Coast. Um, so Ken has a couple other questions. He says, I've read where Chestnut Foundation or maybe one of the chapters had picked a tree that's using its DNA sequence to determine what percentage of a tree is considered to be Castania dentata. How is this possible and who decides what tree it is? I'm gonna answer that one. So we have sequenced, we have fully sequenced a single tree. Uh, that's the Ellis tree from New York. And that's gonna be used for figuring out what genes do and really dive into that genome in particular. But we, in, in order to do the work that you mentioned here, Ken, which is how much percentage Dentata and, and, and Melissima and everything else, we're not just using a single tree. We're using a bunch of trees and saying, these all look like Americans, what's in here? These all look like Chinese, what's in here? So that is populations of trees that we're using for that particular study. I don't know, Taylor, if you have anything to add on to that one. Um, well, I, yeah, so these, these analyses are, um, I, I think they're really solid, like the structure analysis that I mentioned that, that determines percentage ancestry, uh, in discussions with Jared, um, we've, we've dreamed up some, some methods. Well, these methods already exist, but they'll be able to address some of the shortcomings that that structure analysis has. So with these big genomic data sets, our um, estimates of ancestry proportion uh, of, of different backgrounds, uh, they're gonna get better. Right, which, which is great. The more we get in there too. Um, Russell asks, how old is the Chinese chestnut? So uh, Castanea as a genus in Eastern Asia is known from uh, the Middle Eocene 50-ish million years ago. Now, as far as Melissima splitting off from the other species in, in Asia, uh, that's a little more recent. Uh, the phylogenetic paper that I, that I showed did have a divergence time uh, for that split, although I'll, I'll be honest with you, I'm skeptical of it because it is based off of chloroplast DNA, which now we know is just not a really good source of information for evolution of the genus Castanea. Um, all right, we still got a ton more to go. Uh, let's see, are there more fossils from China? Are there Mo fossils? Are there Melissima fossils? Maybe that's it. Are there Melissima fossils from China? If the family or originated there, there seemed that it would be a lot more common than here. Frank asks. So um, reading through the, the literature, it, it looks like, yeah, there are plenty of Castanea fossils in China. 
I had a hard time getting access to, to images of those. So that's why I stuck to North America. And also that's kind of my, uh, my focus. And, and maybe that's something, I don't know if Bruce is on here, but Bruce has always been, Bruce Levine has always been my go-to for seeking the Chinese literature because he can read it and speak it. So if we need to dig into that, maybe we can seek out his assistance. Um, uh, Frank asks, what's the climate when chestnut was growing in the Eocene? I think you covered that, uh, hot and wet, right? Yeah, yeah. In the higher latitudes, like close to the, um, close to the poles, um, I was reading that it could be as much as 30 degrees Fahrenheit warmer to 100 degrees Fahrenheit on average. Hmm. Um, I don't know how that's possible, but <laughs> yeah. So it was, it was very warm in Greenland uh, when these plants were growing up there. So, so Jared chimed in. He says new gen genomic data suggests Melissima is 13 million years old. Okay. Uh, Eric Carlson says, when did the Western North American Castania go extinct? How did these species relate to the modern extant species and did they coexist with Dentata? So um, it looks like sometime between the Eocene and a couple hundred years ago, which is a huge time span. Um, but these fossils, when I was going through and just looking when they stopped appearing in the fossil record, um, plants on the West Coast. That was, it was about, um, I think about 20-ish million years ago were the most recent ones in Washington and British Columbia. Um, but um, as far as like maybe, uh, Arkansas and that area, maybe maybe plants where uh, American chestnut was that far west um, recently. I just don't know. Um, Anita asks, the paleobotany of Castania seems to be much older than the land bridges from Asia, Europe, and the Americas. This seems inconsistent with the hypothesis of an Asian origin of Castania. Can you comment on that? So let's see. Um, my understanding of the of the North Atlantic land bridge is that it had um, it had closed up twenty million years ago, but that it had existed at various points going back to a hundred million years ago, um, which would have allowed those populations to move from one continent to another. Um, and then, and then the Bering Land Bridge, I think, was open for even longer. Um, and of course, it, it closed more recently. Um, so I think that should be consistent with the ages of these fossils occurring where they occur. Uh, Jared asks, could the Castania species once have been one population? So I... I'm skeptical of the idea that there was one population because I think there would have been allopatric barriers, mountain ranges, areas of high elevation that were just too cold and dry for um, Castania to be one continuous uh, population across the Northern Hemisphere. Um, and I think, I think those would have been barriers that we don't know quite as much about as breaks in between continents. Connor asks, how did you find these C. alabamensis trees? Were they well-documented sites? Uh, did you have to find them yourself? Are they on public or private land? So most of them are in the national forest, in the Talladega National Forest, more specifically. Uh, if you hike the Pinoti Trail, it's a long distance trail in, in Alabama, you'll definitely see lots of them. Um, and I found them, I had read some of the literature uh, from Finney Dane's group where they, they had sequenced some plants from around Birmingham and they couldn't figure out these plants and they called them type two sedentata. But they didn't group with 
other American chestnuts in a phylogenetic tree. And so I knew something was up. So I went out there and into the field with an idea that I'd probably see something that was going to be hard to identify. Um, well, great job. Uh, can you comment on the varieties of chinkapin ashii and Flor Floridana, Floridiana? Yeah. So I, I didn't put that in the future work slide, but that's another thing I'm really interested in because I have seen uh, tree chinkapins in northern Florida that if I were using an old and an old dichotomous key from like 100 years ago, yeah, they would key out to Castanea floridana, which um, what's special about that species is it's a chinkapin, usually single stemmed, grows as a tree. Uh, Ashii is, uh, I think that one is a coastal chinkapin that grows on the Atlantic coast of Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina. It's not really recognized as a species now. Um, I did sample plants that match that description for our sequencing study, and they were a little different from like, say, chinkapins from the Appalachians. I wouldn't um, call it a distinct species though. Thanks, Taylor. Connor wants to know the name of the trail. Could you, uh, could you spell that out maybe? Yeah. P-I-N-H-O-T-I. Nice. Connor got it right. Penhoti. Okay. All right. Um, and Becky says, can you make Taylor's slide deck available? Yeah, I think we're going to ask him to provide the PDF. So uh, Sharon, uh, thank you, Sharon, for doing all your work, uh, collating all this stuff on our Chestnut Chat website. We we post the PDF whenever we can. Uh, like I said, this will be recorded and, and put onto YouTube. All that takes about a week for us to put all this together, but all of it will be made available um, pretty soon. Uh, more questions. How do we know? Um, uh, hold on, I want to go up here. Uh, what are the characteristics that distinguish the genus Chrysolepis from Castania? Can you see them in the tertiary fossils from the Western US? Mm, yes. So Chrysolepis is in the fossil record from the Western US in the tertiary. Um, I think, yeah, as far back as the, as the mid Eocene, uh, just like Castanea. Um, so off the top of my head, I couldn't tell you what the like the dichotomous key characters would be because they they don't occur next to one another in the wild now. Um, but I did live on the West Coast for a while and I would see them a lot. And those leaves usually are well, they're more they're thicker and waxier. Um, they also grow to be larger than Castanea, even though they're called golden chinkapin. Uh, they can be well over a hundred feet tall, um, but the leaves are definitely different looking. Uh, they don't have such big toothy margins. Oh, and Kim says they're evergreen. Oh, um, yeah. yep. And uh, there are many genera present in the Western states during the early tertiary that are now found only in the Eastern US, helms, hickories, others besides chestnut. They disappeared with the rise of the coastal ranges, the Cascades, the Sierras, which created a climate in the interior West is very different from what we have in the East. Um, and uh, Steve, what about the environment or errors, eras allow a lot of development in the nut in 6 million years, shown in your slides 56 million years ago to 50 million years ago, and the stability that seems to be the case for the last 50 million years? So I'm going to apply some rationale that I've read for, um, for Quercus because I haven't read anything about this for Castanea, but it's thought that the, the climate of the Eocene being as, as warm and humid as it was across um, much larger areas of the globe than we have now, um, opened up lots of area, lots of habitat for populations to move into, to diversify, to adapt to a particular habitat. And, my guess is that um, probably accelerated morphological evolution, um, having bigger populations, more genetic diversity, more habitat, more selection. Uh, so Jason Smith, I owe you an email, Jason. You'll get it here at the end of the day and it's all yes. So thank you. Um, any speculation on what might drive convergent leaf shapes between Alabamensis and Dentata? 
Hmm. That's, that's an excellent question. Um, so it could be a case of um, what we would call evolutionary stasis. Maybe that leaf shape is closer to um, what was found in the common ancestor of American chestnut and chinkapins. And because alabamensis grows in a similar habitat to dentata, well, right next to one another, they're experiencing similar selection pressures and um, maintaining that leaf shape through time. That would be my guess. Uh, Kent says, pure speculation. Would there be some selective advantage to C. alabamensis versus C. pumila in the southern region? Some, uh, some selective advantage of alabamensis over pumila. Yeah, so maybe folks that have done botany work in the deep south can correct me on this, but I think as we get into the Appalachians, into things like cove forests, Canopies are higher than they're going to be in the coastal plain. Um, and a single stemmed tree is going to have a selective advantage if it can reach the canopy and maximize its, its photosynthetic efficiency. Whereas toward the coastal plain, um, where we see more of an abundance of like the short shrubby chinkapins, um, those experience more disturbance from hurricanes and fires and they need to be able to um, exploit uh, light gaps um, in areas that have gotten uh, lots of disturbance and they need to be able to rebound from that. So um, yeah, I think there's probably a trade-off there. Uh, we got three more, let's see if we can, we can do it. One per minute. Why are some chinkapin trees in the wild, why do they have three nuts per burr instead of just one? So we, um, that's something that, uh, the the group that I'm I'm doing research with now we've we've talked about that quite a bit um, you know it could be a case of the number of nuts per burr being determined by a single gene or a small number of genes and chinkapins are just really morphologically diverse and maybe those alleles that um, that confer multiple nuts per burr just exist at low frequencies in in the wild. Um, but we don't know enough about it. I think it would be cool to map that trait, number of nuts per burr, in a like a segregating population. Um, but yeah, we, we don't know really. Um, how do we know Castania first emerged in, a emerged in Asia and not North America? How do we know the reverse is not true? So that's, uh, in, in my opinion, we, we, we don't know. I, I don't think the evidence is is really overwhelming in favor of that idea. Um, it's mainly the fact that species diversity and genetic diversity within those species is highest in Eastern Asia. And based off of just um, logic from biogeography, um, usually where genetic diversity is highest is where is closer to the um, place where a group would have originally evolved. Uh, Frank says, why does Castania have so little diversity versus Quercus? Hmm. Yeah, so that's not sure about that. Yeah, I have, I have no idea. Maybe, maybe Kim knows the answer to that question. Um, Sorry to put you on the spot there, Kim. <laughs> um, uh, I've been getting a lot of questions about chestnut weevil. That's completely tangential. Uh, but, but Sander, I think uh, maybe we can take this off into a email conversation. Um, so shoot me an email and maybe we can continue that and I'll, I'll see what we can figure out uh, for you in terms of weevils. Um, uh, Paul Kendra is answering your question right now. Um, uh, we're coming in right under the bell at, at one o'clock. Uh, thanks again, Taylor, this was fantastic. I can't tell you how many kudos are in the chat that people love this presentation. I love it, it was fantastic, really well organized. Um, there's a lot of really great chat in there too. Just people, I know John French uh, chimed in, some really amazing information. Uh, the chat will be conserved, so we'll have that available to you all after the chat. Um, Taylor, thank you for taking time um, away from the farm to, I know this, <laughs> uh, maybe it's a cold day where you want to be inside for a little bit. I appreciate you uh, taking all this time 
uh, to give us this amazing presentation and I'll be look forward to uh, the results of your studies. I uh, hope you guys can all tune in next month for Paul Schauberg uh, to talk about uh, a cold tolerance. Uh, there's my one o'clock bird. So uh, thanks everybody and uh, I'll see you next month. Thanks Taylor. Thank you Sarah. All right, see ya.